Well, good evening and welcome to a Christmas edition of Stories for the Cooped Up and Captive. Now this evening, this story has both a preamble and a postscript, so stay tuned. The preamble is, this story is true. As you will see, the deck has been shuffled, the names and the locations have been changed to protect the families involved. So away we go. In 25 years of veterinary practice, I have known a lot of farm dogs. I've known ones that had ripped our leg off for looking at them. My friend Ned and Sarah, they had a blue healer named Jack. Jack endured collisions with 42 implements ranging from a nine iron to a school bus. Then there was Mary. There was always something about Mary. I had worked on Dave's dairy for a good long time, but from minute one, there was a soulful interdependence between that farmer and that purpose-driven herd dog that could not be denied. Over the years, her trot slowed to a saunter, her haunches dropped, and her hocks thinned. But for 14 years, she never let Dave out of her sight. Today, Mary retired. She lay in the breezeway, curled up in her dog bed. Dave lay nose to nose with her on the cold concrete. In his left hand, he cradled her head. In his right, he stroked her ear. I approached quietly as I could, and on a nod from Dave, I squatted, installed the tourniquet, raised the vein, set the needle, and pushed the plunger. Mary gave two mighty sighs and faded into peace. Full grown men, veterinarian and a farmer, there were tears and there were hugs. I went to my truck to stow my drugs and with one foot in the gravel and one on the floorboard of my pickup truck, I looked to the front porch to see Dave, with his head buried in his hands. The space next to him on the step felt like a friend in need. So I took my spot gave him a rub on the shoulders and sat and watched the alfalfa wave in the breeze. When he finally came up for air, he wiped his snot on his t-shirt and commenced to tell me about the day that Mary came to his farm. Now for those of us to remember, old enough to remember, the summer of 1988 was dust bowl drought. That fall, crops got stranded in the field by torrential rains. Mary came to the farm Christmas Eve, 1988. Dave was milking cows. He had not spoken a word in two turns of the four units he had hanging on a string of skinny Holstein Jersey crosses. He turned to take an utter towel from his son, Tommy. Tommy, who at four years of age, doctors and mental health professionals had diagnosed as so deeply autistic that maybe Dave and Joan should consider having him committed to an institution. 10 years later, Dave and Tommy had not missed a milking together. The old metal stanchions groaned against cows leaning in, their 40 grit tongues scraping for just a bite of feed. The barn radio, played Christmas polkas and cackled in cadence with the pulsators. But all Dave heard was a winter wind whistling between the boards of the barn, snow drifting and chaff skittering across the floor of the bare naked haymow above his head. He finished milking and sent Tommy to the house to get ready for Christmas Eve dinner. You see, Christmas is when a working man validates the scar on his brow and the empty seat at the dinner table with a airsoft rifle for his son, doll set for his daughter, maybe a nice necklace for his wife for when she goes to town. But all he had to show was a couple of wooden farm toys and two six month old lab mutts from the farm down the road. Dave was 45 years old and Norway strong. He could split a quart of firewood before lunch and mow a thousand bales of hay before evening chores. But today, 40 paces from the barn to the house was all he could handle. He walked under the third generation sign and 
It was all he could do not to fall in the gravel and curl up in the fetal position. He staggered onto the front porch into the light of the living room, pouring out. He looked in to see his family, his wife, his two kids, the two dogs, Mary and Joseph, and his parents, playing in front of the fireplace around the Christmas tree. He let himself in the back door and kicked off his rubber boots and hung up his coat. When he did, he looked high at the 357 Magnum sitting on the shelf that they kept for varmints and intruders. He took the gun down, he put it back up. But every time he tried to step into the light of the living room and join the family to whom he was their rock, the acid started to rise in his throat at the thought of the empty haymow, bolt tank, and checkbook. So finally he took the gun down and loaded it. Still in his stocking feet, he shuffled through the mudroom and out onto the porch. Behind him, he closed, locked, and latched the big wooden farmhouse door. He sat on the steps with his forearms across his knee, cut, clutching that cold blue steel, enveloped in the steam rising off of his waffle weave. He started to tremble. The tremble grew to a convulsion. Finally, he cocked the hammer. In a motion, he sat bolt upright, raised his elbow high, and buried the barrel of that gun against his temple. He closed his eyes, and in a silent primal scream, he squeezed the trigger. The percussion of that handheld cannon echoed off the farm fields and across the rivers and faded into silence of the cold black waters of the Mississippi River. Upon impact, 125 grams of lead traveling 1,500 feet per second ripped a six inch gash in the steel roof of his 60 foot silo. Dave found himself on that porch more as the last act of a desperate man. He had given zero thought to what the afterlife might entail, but what he did not anticipate was laying asshole over tea kettle in a snow drift being face washed by a six month old Labrador pup. You see, as it turns out, des Dave's most desperate moment exactly coincided with Mary's most intense need for love. She had jumped on his arm and dislodged that gun from his head. Ringing, still in his ear, he staggered to his feet back onto the porch. His family, including Joseph, the other dog, were still playing, oblivious in the living room. The door, was still locked and latched, and there was no new footprints in the snow. Now, you can call it what you want, God, Buddha, Allah, Abba, or Aaron Rodgers. But by my way of thinking, without a dose of divine intervention in the presence of a six-month-old Labrador pup, that farm today would be a Brookstone subdivision. So, if all else fails, Believe in something, even if it's yourself. Now for the postscript. Remember Tommy, the autistic son who was diagnosed at four years of age and told that he should maybe go to a, uh, an institution? Well, he did go to an institution, the University of Wisconsin Platteville. Today, he's an ag and special special ed instructor, and Dave still farms with his son and two of his grandkids. So if all else fails, keep something moving forward and Merry Christmas.